Hi, everyone, and thank you for listening to this webinar. My name is Fatima Vakili. I did my master's and PhD in contaminant hydrogeology at the University of Waterloo. My PhD research was focused on using uh, compound specific isoconalysis or CSIA to investigate whether physical processes change isotopic ratios of chlorinated ethenes. Um, CSIA is being used increasingly to address environmental issues these days. So in this webinar, I will talk about um, applications of CSIA in contaminant hydrogeology. So I will start off with a uh, definition of um, isotopes. Um, isotopes are uh, nucleides of the same element with equal number of protons and different number of neutrons. Uh, for example, oxygen isotopes have eight protons, but different number of neutrons, which gives them um, different atomic weights and therefore different physical properties. Um, an example I usually use to illustrate isotopes uh, is apples. They're all apples, but slightly different. So these are um, the most common environmental um, isotopes uh, in contaminant hydrogeology and their um, ratios, um, which uh, are the ratios of heavy to um, light isotopes. So in order to um, ensure the isotopic uh, ratios measured at different laboratories are comparable and accurate, the ratios are expressed relative to an international uh, reference. Uh, for example, uh, Vienna standard mean ocean water for oxygen. And the measured values are reported as delta values. And since the delta values are very small, they are multiplied by 1,000 and reported as um, part per 1,000 or per mm. So basically, it just explained what this um, formula is. Isotopic ratios of the contaminant can be affected by several processes in the soft surface. This process can be physical, such as sorption, diffusion, dilution, and volatilization, and uh, biological and chemical processes, uh, such as biodegradation or um, abiotic degradation. So the general acceptance is uh, physical processes do not change its topic uh, ratios significantly, but um, degradation uh, processes um, do. So why biodegradation um, changes the topic uh, ratios uh, significantly? Um, assume we have a solution um, that contains uh, TCA molecules with uh, light and heavy isotopes and then add bacteria to this solution. So the bacteria breaks down the molecules with uh, light isotopes. So the remaining solution becomes enriched in um, um, molecules with uh, heavy isotopes over time. So when we plot uh, carbon versus chlorine isotopes, the trend is toward, toward heavier um, isotopes. So what are the applications of the CSIA? Um, it can be used in environmental forensics to identify the source of contamination in groundwater and also in indoor air. It can be used to understand whether contaminants um, are degrading or not. And it can also be used to monitor the performance of um, active remediation um, techniques. So uh, what is compound specific um, isoconalysis? It is a method uh, in which uh, each compound is being analyzed uh, for its isotopes uh, individually. For example, assume a groundwater sample that uh, contains um, tetrachloroethylene or PCE, trichloroethylene, dichloroethylene, and uh, vinyl chloride, um, which um, all of them have carbon and chlorine isotopes. If we don't use CSIA, 
we get a bulk of value for carbon isotopes and bulk value for chlorine isotopes. But with CSIA, each compound is being uh, separated first and then um, it is analyzed for its um, stable isotopes. CSIA works uh, uh, well for chlorinated solvents because they are manufactured products and um, their isotopic signatures can uh, vary depending on the isotopic ratios of uh, the starting material and also uh, the particular um, chemical processes used to manufacture the product. Um, so as you can see here in this uh, plot, um, for example, PCE, the um, red circles um, from different manufacturers has different isotopic signatures and the same for TCEs and TCAs from different uh, manufacturers. So for example, if there are several dry cleaners in an area and they use um, PCE with different isotopic signatures, their releases to the subsurface can be distinguished using CSIA. This is a case study by Hunkler and others in 2004, uh, where they studied an old dry cleaner site in um, and this Ontario. Um, this is the plume um, here and the uh, uh, groundwater flow direction is to the northwest. So they installed two rows of uh, multi-level um, groundwater sampler perpendicular to um, groundwater flow direction. Uh, one of them um, here close to the source and the other one um, close to the river, which is 220 meters um, away from um, the sun. So they collected uh, groundwater samples uh, for chemical concentrations and stable carbon isotope analysis. Uh, this figure shows distribution of PCE and delta values for carbon isotopes along um, the um, source um, transect. So different shapes here um, uh, indicate different um, range of uh, concentrations uh, for PCE. So by looking at the isotope data in high concentration zones, um, um, we can uh, see um, these uh, three um, domains with distinct data values. And uh, since um, there was no evidence of biodegradation in high concentra concentration zones, these three domains um, can uh, represent different episodes and locations of PCE release. This figure shows PCE distribution and delta values uh, for carbon isotopes at the river transect. Um, the data shows that the three domains at the core of the uh, plume are preserved um, even 220 meter down gradient of um, the source. Now I'm going to talk about a case study that we did at um, Dragon. Uh, we don't have a permission to reveal the name of the site, so um, I use property A and property B instead. Um, there were TC hotspot on both uh, side, sides of the road. Uh, on property A and property B, groundwater flow direction is from, from northwest to southeast. And so the owner of property B believe the source of contamination on their property is uh, property A. Um, groundwater chemistry was similar for both uh, sides of the road. And there was some evidence of uh, biodegradation. So in this case, the traditional um, methods based on concentration data could not answer whether property e is, is, A is the source or um, and there are two separate sources. But um, how could CSIA help in this case? Uh, we knew that uh, biodegradation was happening and uh, 
we know um, that biodegradation shifts the isotopic ratios toward more positive values over time. So if property A was um, the source of uh, contamination on property B, um, the delta values for carbon and chlorine isotopes of TCE on property B, um, the red triangle, uh, should be uh, more positive uh, than the uh, isotopic uh, ratios of TCE on property A, the green diamond. Um, uh, because um, TC on property uh, B has traveled a longer distance uh, over a longer period of time, and therefore it has undergone more biodegradation. Um, but our data showed um, the opposite. The delta values uh, um, on property B were less positive, uh, which means the source on property B is younger than the source on property A, and they are um, different um, release, different sources. So we can also use isotopes uh, to identify the source of nitrate in groundwater. This is the nitrogen versus oxygen plot by Kendall and others, uh, which uh, shows the range of uh, delta values uh, for oxygen and nitrogen for fertilizer, uh, manure, um, septic waste, and so on. Another application of CSIA is to identify the source of indoor air contamination. Is the contaminated vapor from the subsurface or there is an indoor source? The shaded area on these plots indicate a likely range of isotopic ratios for household products reported by Macu and others. So if uh, we collect an indoor air sample and um, a soil vapor sample and the data distribution is similar to plot A, there is a strong evidence that an indoor source is the primary source of indoor air contamination. And if data distribution is similar to plot B, a subsurface source is the primary source of indoor air contamination. CSIA can be used to confirm whether biodegradation is happening, and if so, uh, monitor the progress of biodegradation and uh, calculate their degradation rate. Um, sometimes uh, degradation processes stall at a point. For example, CCE stall, where PCE and TCE degrade to CCE and uh, stall at that point uh, because of uh, electron donor limitation or biological limitation. We can use CSIA to understand if um, there is a stall. So if the isotopic ratios of CCC do not change over time, it means that um, there is a stall. And with those information, uh, we can um, decide whether monitored natural attenuation is feasible or not, because uh, to determine the feasibility, uh, we need to know if there is any type of degradation and what's the extent of degradation. Another application of CSIA is to monitor the performance of um, active remediation system. Uh, for example, TCA or trichloroethane can be treated using heat activated persulfate, zero valent iron, and hydrolysis and dehydrohalogenation, which all of them are abiotic degradation. So, based on this graph by Plow and um, others, we can use um, carbon and chlorine isotopes to understand what process is affecting the contaminant, because as you can see, um, each process um, has um, uh, different um, 
So for example, if we have a permeable reactive barrier at a TCA impacted site, and our isotope data follow um, this blue line, it means that the PRB system is uh, functioning. And this is the last slide before I um, wrap it up. This plot is from a paper by Butcher and others. They prepared this plot to illustrate the uh, expected uh, carbon and hydrogen isotope um, trends for benzene during biodegradation, chemical oxidation, and physical removal processes. So this plot helps to evaluate the performance of uh, remediation system. Uh, for example, um, if we have uh, a sulfate injection at a site impacted with uh, petroleum hydrocarbons, and our isotope data uh, falls in this area, it means uh, the injection performs as uh, planned. So basically, we can use um, CSIA to understand um, the fate of contaminant um, in the subsurface. So in summary, um, CSIA um, is a useful method. They can be uh, used in environmental forensics to answer whether there is a single source of contamination or multiple sources, whether nitrate is naturally occurring or it's from chemical, chemical fertilizer or manure. Um, in remediation assessment, uh, it can be used to find out whether there is uh, bioremediation, and if so, what's the rate of it, um, and what's the extent, uh, whether abiotic degradation, such as uh, in-situ chemical oxidation or in-situ um, uh, chemical reduction was successful or not, and also if there is um, rate-limiting steps, such as uh, cystic cell and also um, if amount or natural attenuation is feasible at the site. Thank you for your time, and um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, here's my contact information. Um, please reach out if you have any questions on this webinar or need help with your environmental concerns.